everybody, welcome to What the Flick. I'm Matt, this is John. We are here to talk about the second episode of season six of Game of Thrones uh, called Home. Boy, a lot of stuff went down. Uh, as you probably guess, we're gonna spoil a lot because <laughs> holy shit, guess who's back? Davos. Back again. Davos is back. Tell a friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, surprising everyone because nobody predicted it. Nobody saw it coming. Right. Jon Snow uh, did return, although just, just, just at the end. All right, but that's at the very end of the show. Should yes. we let's let's talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. early on in the show. So the show opens up with somebody we haven't, somebody else that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Bran, right? Yeah, Bran. So we do. Who Bran. looks a lot older because he's yeah. grown up. There's a bit of the Harry Potter going on where yeah. between seasons they grow a foot and a half. Yeah. Uh, by the seventh movie, Ron Weasley was seven feet tall. Actually, <laughs> it's pretty horrifying. He didn't fit, but. Yeah, he's uh he's looking like his training is going along well. Yeah, so we get these we get this interesting scene where he's you know, initially I thought, God, did they recast young Bran? We see these two kids mm -hmm. training and I'm thinking, well, that kid's too big now. Maybe they recast. No, it's it's he's actually having visions of his father mm -hmm. and Benjamin Stark uh, training and Benjamin then, finally appearing again. Yeah, finally appearing. <laughs> and then Lyanna comes in, and we see uh, also a very young Hodor, who we learn his name is Willis. Yeah. Right now, that's a little bit different because in the book, Old Nan kind of mentioned that his name was Walder. Yes. Early in the book, right? his name was Walder, and we also knew already in the books how he lost his ability to speak, which right. is not spoiling territory. It's not a grand mystery or anything right. like that. Um, but it was it was cool to see him when he was still like. You can see Hodor in him, the way he moves right. and everything, but, but he, he wanted to fight. Right. And yeah, I liked that. He actually had words. He had right? words, yeah. And then Bran comes out of the vision, he's talking to him, and what kind of reaction do we get? What do we think we're going to get? Hodor. Exactly. <laughs> right? Oh, like, yeah, to see it taken away from him again. And also, the you, you look at Hodor and you think, there might be something inside of him where he remembers, like where he knows yeah. that he was something different at one point. Um, but from the vision, what I noticed is I love that uh, Lyanna, who I guess I hadn't known or remembered, was apparently the oldest, uh, also a bit of a dick. Cause she goes in and, and fucks with her brothers right. and everything. Um, but I wonder why they would remind us about Lyanna Stark. Why would she all of a sudden be featured prominently in a scene? I don't hmm. know. Maybe we'll find out in a future flashback. Yeah, I mean, look, like, when we talk about that stuff, there's a thing called the law of the economy of characters where you don't bring in a character unless something's going to be interesting with them. And uh, kind of on that note, it's interesting to see Max von Sydow as kind of that human aspect of... The Three-Eyed Raven, a character that we don't have the full name of yet, mm -hmm. and you cast a guy like Cedow in that part because, I mean, Force Awakens notwithstanding, you expect to get more out of him. And yeah, yeah. Max von Cedow is such a great I actor. Forgot that was him. Yeah. Yeah, I, such a such a great great actor. But it's cool to see. One of the things I liked about that flashback scene is is he's standing on that catwalk mm -hmm. with Bran, and they're watching, and then he turns back to Bran at one point, and Bran's gone down into the action, and there's that look from Cedow like. Oh, what's wait a minute? What's he doing? Yeah, right. And and they come out of the vision. Like he takes the vision away, and Bran's upset. He's like, "Oh, I was home. I was I was enjoying myself." And he's he's like, "Yeah, the world under the sea is beautiful, but if you stay too long, you'll drown." Which which reminds me a bit of there's a character from the books who doesn't appear in the show, so I don't think it matters. But it's a um, like a jester character, right? Who has lost his mind by having drowned for a little while. Patchface, right? Patchface, yeah. yeah. And he says things that are very similar to what right. the Three-Eyed Raven says there. Uh, so as I, I always go and I read the reviews, like I read the AV Club review and the IGN review, and sometimes Forbes as well. And uh, I had missed that him looking down there at the beginning of the the episode, or, or a little bit into the episode, brings us back to the beginning of the show. Which starts with John and Bran practicing in the right. courtyard and everything. So it was a nice way to return home, right? In that way, um, I did notice. I get uh, Max von Sydow seems like a great actor. I don't have the familiarity with his his movie past and everything that, that you do, obviously. Um, but it does seem a bit odd that when they first introduced the Three Eyed Raven, he was like a fairly desiccated man in this throne. Right. But even then, he was not nearly as corrupted by age and nature as he is in the books where he's like he's half tree basically right but now with the shot that i, I posted on instagram uh, of that quote that you just read it's basically like max van Cito like lounging on a wicker chair at this point yeah, like, practically. it doesn't even matter that he's part of it well part he of the thing so virile what part of the thing about max von Cito is that he i mean he's a legend i mean worked with bergman like he's he's one of those guys that like 
he can say, yeah, you're not going to put me in the chair. You're not going to cover me in trees. Mm -hmm. All right, you're Max Watson. Yeah, fine. I guess, yeah. All right, fine. I, we're happy to have you. Yeah. Uh, but I, I like that. I like the in that the other thing we get in that scene is that hint from that child of the forest. Is it Leaf? Oh, is I didn't even catch a name. Um, I th if I remember correctly, that character's name is Leaf in the books. Um, if I've I forgotten. And I, also, I think it's a different child than was in the previous maybe. seasons. Maybe. Anyway, so she's talking. You know, she's watching what what happens, and then she goes out and tells Marin, "Hey, you need to." come back inside because Bran's going to need you. Yeah. Who's still obviously grieving over the loss of her brother. And it feels so separated from right. everything. Right. And they show that the physical distance is, is amazing. Right. Yeah. That's, that's going to be an interesting storyline to watch. But we get that little bit of an opening and then we cut to Castle Black. Yeah. Um, oh, well, wait, really fast on that. We do get one extra hint, though. Uh, she says um, that he's going to need your help. Right. When you go back out into the right. world. He's not which is stay like, here oh, forever. Good. Right. We're gonna go back out in the world. That's right. awesome. Because previously, for all we know, he's gonna be in a tree for six. He'll be the years. next tree. Right. Exactly. Right. So that, that's good to know. Yeah. So he'll be unless he's a walking tree. <laughs> An ent, perhaps. Exactly. If he heads uh, for the ent moot. Right. Uh, we are gonna get a moot, but not an ent moot. Exactly. Right? We'll yeah. Talk Hopefully, about it'll moots. go faster. Right. Talk about moots in a bit. Uh, Castle Black. We see Alistair Thorne. Like, hey, everybody, come out. You gotta join your brothers. And you see all those guys outside with like. Yeah, their, their crossbows pointed I don't at the trust door. Alistair like, Thorne. Yeah, I don't, don't think, uh, uh, I don't think Thorne so. Thorne's kind of a dick. Um, I liked one of the things I really liked about the way that scene was was staged was that they're banging on the door and they're about to break down that door, and then you hear these other banging mm -hmm. at the Castle Black Gate. Yeah, and there's more banging, and it's and it's it's this nice kind of callback to what they were just doing, and then the door bursts. You know, the gate bursts open, and there's the giant and all of the wildlings yeah. come in because yay Ed's back. Ed's back and it, like we predicted, they right. interrupted it just in time. The nick of time. Just in time. Um, I, I, it's interesting, even though obviously we wanted Ed to get the wildlings and have them come back after watching the show for so many years and reading it and all that. Seeing wildlings break down the gates of Castle Black still an uncomfortable thing to watch. Yeah. Because for all we know, they'd been like this is Game of Thrones. They could have just cut off Ed's head, and then they have Castle Black. Like, right. they may have just used it to get in. Even though I guess they didn't really need his help to get in. Well, and I, they had you know, giant. and that's the thing. John offered them, kind of, they, he offered them refuge, right? So, yeah. you know, the wildlings still, they haven't necessarily bent the knee, but you know, and say they what you him. will, they owe him, right? And they know that, right? They absolutely know that, and so they're. They're there to make things right, and yeah. you know we'll we'll see how that all goes. I like that, you know, the giant gets shot by the one guy <laughs> at the crossbow, and he just looked more ticked off than anything else. He's like, and then grabs that guy and like crushes oh him. Oh my frozen. god! Don't shoot the giant. Right. Definitely. That that scene had shades of. There's a very popular gif that came out of the first Avengers movie of the Hulk taking right. Loki and just right. smashing Cutie him left guy. and right. There was a lot of that. Well, and one of the things that was interesting is it makes you realize, especially. It reinforces a couple of things, most notably why John needs to bring the wildlings in on their side because Castle Black is so, like the Night's Watch is spread so thin, right? Like these guys come in and they make short work of the Night's Watch. They kill they one. They, they kill one guy. Which is they, like 1 40th of the Night's Watch right, at this point. Right, they, they take Thorn and his cronies and that kid and the they kid. just throw him in the dungeon, Ollie. right? And that's kind of it, but that's like yeah. all the resistance that there is because, again, like all these guys see that giant and they're like, uh, all right, we're not going to do it. Or, okay, yeah. you win. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, if, if the Night's Watch still had two or three hundred members, then maybe they could that take be... the giant, but. Right. Yeah, and, right. That, and that's not just a giant. That's like the badass giant. Right. Um, yeah, I obviously in, a, in a, an episode or two, we're going to see Alistair Thorne. They're going to go and talk to him and all that. Right. But we do know from the past, don't lock up people. Kill people because if you lock them up, they kill you in a future season. That tends to be what happens. Yes, we do see that, but I, it'll be interesting. We'll see what happens with Thorn. Yeah, I mean, what's he gonna do? Stab John again? What again. is dead may never die. Right. Um, yeah. So I have I have a criticism too of the way this scene played out, but I'm gonna save it for the when we wrap around to the okay. rest of the okay. Jon Snow. So then we cut to King's Landing, right? And we start off with that guy telling that joke about Cersei, right? Which was funny. Which was like. He was half right. an inch short of an inch. Right. That's, right. that's we, good from right. medieval times. Right. We see him talking about that, and then you see him wander off, and he's taking a leak. And, like, the minute, you know, you watch a show like this, like, 
oh, that guy's by himself. He's dead. Yeah, definitely. He's dead. And, and dead, it's interesting. So there's two giants in the episode, and they kill their people roughly the same way, just smash their head against the wall. Right, right. Yeah. What are they now? Have they given him a name? It, weren't they calling him Robert Strong? Yes, Robert right? Strong, yes. Uh, which I don't. Unrelated to Mark Strong, the excellent British actor. Yes, and Robert Baratheon. But yeah. I do like that they gave him the same name. Um, actually, that's interesting that they gave him the same name. I wonder if that. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll wrap around to that too. Uh, yeah, it, it of course begs the question that scene. I mean, the scene is funny, right. and it reminds you of how Robert Strong is this physical, imposing force. Right, because it's, it, it's the mountain. Because it's the mountain, presumably. Uh, and then it right. seems how many odd. guys that big are walking around? Come on. I don't know. Other than half giants. I mean, right. the mountain, I think, is bigger than Hodor. As big as Hodor. Well, we know it's not Hodor. We know it's not Hodor. Um, but he doesn't talk. Um, yeah, so right, which is how we know it's not Hodor. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so is is he just wandering around looking for people bad-mouthing Cersei? Which seems bizarre, but then you think, oh, it's Cersei. She might well tell him to wander around looking for yeah, people bad-mouthing her. That's Probably. something she would totally do as entertainment. Yeah, you would think so. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. And then we see that she's kind of locked up. I love the scene where she wants to get out of the Red Keep, and mm. there's those guards that are telling her no, right? And then becomes this standoff for a minute where Robert Strong's hand goes to his sword, yeah. and all of those guards put their hands on their swords, and there's this moment like, oh, uh, oh no. This could be bad. Right? And then Cersei kind of backs down a little bit. And it's not until they turn around and leave that you see, understandably, all these guys like, oh, yeah. thank, thank God. God. And, and I don't know if they could take him. I mean, it's a lot of guys. It's a lot He's of guys. A giant, but right. Can you can you harm him? Can he be killed? I don't yeah. know. Uh, we see in his body language the way that he, his hand goes to his sword. He looks to her for direction, right? And that tells you a lot about what he is. He's not a totally unthinking zombie, presumably. Like there, there is some intelligence and uh, like thinking going on. Like he's trying to read from what she does whether he should attack or not. Um, I don't know that that'll matter, but there's something to him. And also, she willingly backs off. Like, the, the Cersei that right. we've known in the past would have just sent, kill these men. Right. But she chooses not to, so maybe her experience with the Walk of Shame has actually changed her. Maybe. Maybe, or she knows that, you know, this guy maybe can't take all those guys. Right. Well, she's like, not sure, yeah. She's not sure. Maybe she's keeping her powder dry. I, she might be. Might be. So then she, we see, you know, it was interesting that she was sewing her dress. Like, that's something that the old Cer Cersei wouldn't have done yeah. either. Like, that she's changed. She's changed. Yeah. This scene, this the events in King's Landing set up some interesting stuff because we get to see Tommen and Jamie at Marcella's funeral. Yes. Right. And Tommen Good is scene. talking about. Um, yeah, that was an interesting scene because he's he. Tommen is talking about. You know, early on he says, "Oh, he told me to do X," and you're like, "Oh, he's talking about the High Sparrow, mm -hmm. right?" Like he's. He's telling Jamie, oh, well, he told me to keep it, to keep my mother locked up, and he told me she couldn't come, and then he starts lamenting about how he wasn't strong enough for them. And I think that we see the hints, you know, we talked about this, about the idea of Jamie and Cersei deciding that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take on everybody. Yeah. And I think that what we see in this scene is Tommen is gonna be their pawn in that, because Tommen you know, is counseled by Jamie, go and beg your mother's forgiveness. And he says, you know, I should have been strong enough to keep, to protect my mother. I should have been strong, you know, I should have taken the King's Guard in and gone and fought all of the sparrows. Yeah. Right? And he's lamenting that. He regrets it. And I think that we may see him trying to be stronger at Jamie and Cersei's behest. Yeah. I think that's going to go really badly for everybody in the kingdom because they're going to say things like, yeah, attack Dorne. And he'll be like, yeah, that's right, Mom. He wants to I'm, show he's strong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So first he gets advice from Jamie. A little bit later on, he gets advice from his mom. And he wants to, like, he wishes that he'd done more earlier. What I would have liked is there should be a scene or two where they show, assuming that, similar to the books, that the, the, the sparrows are increasing in number over time. Like, this is not like a static situation. Right. Like, the longer you wait, the more of them there are. Right. And he, I mean, the high, the high sparrow sort of implies, you know, we can topple a nation. Obviously, he thinks that he has a lot of numbers. It's very ballsy of Jamie to go into that situation, that they would, after what happened with the church, that they would even have the funeral for Marcella there. Like, that's incredibly risky, like, going into there and bringing the king. 
God right. knows what the High Sparrow might do at that point. Well, but, you know, I think Jamie still, as much as he's lost his hand, I think that there's at least being in King's Landing and, and the discussion that he's had with Cersei, like, there's still a little bit of that old, arrogant Jamie there, right? Mm -hmm. Like, And, you know, when when the Septon comes in and he starts talking to him, and, gr you know, another great performance by Jonathan Price, you see this great scene where Jamie, you know, not even backhandedly, like, basically kind of threatens the Septon. Mm -hmm. And the Septon's like, okay, sure. Like, then why not? Right? And, like, kind of calls his bluff. And then you see all of the other sparrows come in. Yeah. And that's where you get the sense of, like, oh, they're, you know, I think within the confines of, of the budget of the show and, the, and where you have to spend your production budget, I think they did a good job of when he says, look, like, these are all people who have nothing. Like, we have nothing, but together we can overthrow an empire yeah and that's gonna come to an interesting head you know we hadn't even discussed that last week like you know are the Lannisters gonna tilt towards war with Dorne but yet they've got all of these this sparrows first. that they have to deal with as well like and and there's been hints in the production that there's gonna be some giant battle scenes coming perhaps in perhaps the Sept. yeah in, in this, Baylor's in this right or just in this season in general so it could be something you know we know from the books the risk of being spoilery we know that there's some big battle scenes that that are teased in Winds of Winter that are going to happen, mm -hmm. that may happen, right? There's been some chapters that have talked about big battle scenes that are happening across the sea. Yeah. And But maybe we see, maybe we don't see those this season. Maybe we see something that's closer to home. Maybe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I liked everything about that scene, both because, uh, I mean, Jamie makes clear that the sort of weird hypocrisy and misogyny of the church, that they care more about the homophobic uh, crimes right. and women lying then, I mean, Jamie's, he deserves to be killed 10 times over for the things that he's done. Right. But they don't, even after admitting that, like he's got all of his sparrows, they don't arrest him. They let him go. Right. Uh, but, but also they don't make, as with most of their villains, other than possibly Ramsay, they don't make the High Sparrow an impossible to understand villain. Like he talks about his fears. He calls his bluff. But I think he was willing to die. Like I think no, he absolutely he was. believes it. Like he, yeah, and Jamie Jamie has, is growing and changing too. Like I think Jamie of season one or two kills the High Sparrow and right. fights those guys and probably dies. But Jamie can still be outmaneuvered, right? Mm -hmm. Like Jamie can still be outmaneuvered in this situation like that because the Septon's like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And even with all those guys, Jamie says to him, "They can't stop you. They can't stop me from striking you down." And the Septon says, yeah, I know. Yeah. And you could probably take a bunch of them out, too. Yeah. Okay. Jamie wisely doesn't attack. Even right. Jamie, great fighter, not the smartest guy, necessarily. And also, whoever does their props or weapons, costumes, uh, I like that they had the, um, the sparrows. They had maces, and they also had this weird weapon that was like a plank with four spikes coming out of one right. side. Just a brutal look. Like, right. It looks like what you'd use on a stake. Right. Um, right. It's like nails in a baseball bat. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Very, very common. Very brutal. They don't have swords well, it's, or anything it's like do that. Do it yourself. It's like either what he we made found, it, yeah. or I just made myself because I'm not because they don't have the money to buy weapons. Exactly. Yeah, and, and a lot of other shows would simply have thrown some of their old swords at those people to right. use. Uh, and so I like that little touch. Right. All right. So yeah. we go to Marine. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, things. well. One, one other thing oh. with the uh, once we leave there, we have Cersei and Tommen. Oh, right. And what I found interesting about that was Cersei's reluctance to even look at Tommen. After her emotional breakdown in the previous episode about losing her kids, right? She this is like her sweetest child, perhaps, and she can't even look at him when he comes for forgiveness. She hugs right. him and all that, um, but you can see that she's like preparing herself for his death. Yeah, or at least she's afraid of it, right? Like she's yeah. she's acknowledged in that final episode that the that the witch was right, mm -hmm. and and she has to be that has to be on her mind. Yeah, right. So you wonder. You know, and again, like we're blazing new territory. We're not on what the books give us any guidance on. You know, is she? So we don't. You know, we don't know what she's thinking. Where there's a lot of chapters in the books that we know what Cersei's thinking, and we don't know anymore. So do, do is she making plans, knowing that Tommen's going to die? Yeah, and, and maneuvers to use that as some kind of sacrifice in whatever plans. Then again. She's never, I mean, that's one of the things, we talked about this a lot last season. Cersei's never as good at the politics game as she thinks she as is. she thinks she is, yeah. She's never as good, right? She thinks she's great at it, and she's actually terrible at it. She might be better now, though, 
because she was always like she's smart. But she allowed her emotions to right. take take over, cause her to make bad decisions. She seems more aware of that now. For now. That she's a mean person, a jealous person, a vindictive person. That might make her better at the politics. We'll see. And one other thing I was thinking during that scene was there's been opportunities in the books and in the show so far for Cersei to die, certainly. Like when she was in that cell, she could have gone to trial or something like that. But I, I, I've never really thought that she was seriously in risk of dying. But now that we're we're off in a new territory, God knows what might happen. I w what I would like is, if she's going to die, I think that it would be great if it was in defense of Tommen, like to save Tommen's life, because she has always been about her family, about protecting her kids. She can't be redeemed for the things that she's done. But if she was willing to die in defense of Tommen, I think that that would be a sweet close to who she was as a character. Maybe. It might never happen. She might yeah, survive maybe. the whole time. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It'll be interesting because I could see a world in which she also, you know, tr is willing to do that but still sees Tom and die anyway. Oof. Right? Like, that's, look, like, Oof. that's the knife twisting that George R.R. Martin herself, does. Maybe. Well, maybe. Right? But not after, not until after seeing Tom and die. That would right? be brutal. Yeah. But possible. Like, right? Like, now she knows in no uncertain terms that that's likely because she seemed to happen with two other kids, and so, you know, it'll be, that'll be interesting. Yeah. That'll be, yeah, it'll be, I don't know, like you're almost, wor I, it's weird, we're talking about, like, I'm almost worried for Cersei. Yeah, oh, because she's Who been is through awful. so much. She had the walk of shame, like, if anything is going to make you empathize with a person, that's, it's something like that, or, or Theon's torture, for instance, as bad of a person as, as he was. Right. Um, and we're getting to the point in the show and in the books where we're starting to wonder who is going to make it to the finish line. We're yeah. losing character. We lost like three major characters. We saw this someone episode. almost didn't make it this seat. This this particular episode. Like I thought this could be the episode where we lose Tyrion. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like, well, we we want to turn to that. Yeah. So let's talk about Marine. So there's this you know it's this conference with Tyrion and Varys and Missandei and Grey Worm and Tyrion makes this joke like hey you know about because he's drinking and they point something out and he's like listen if I lost my cock I'd be drinking all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, which was fun, you know, like you get a little hints of the Tyrion and Varys show again, which is yeah. always kind of fun to watch. <laughs> and, and Varys is, I, I don't make dwarf jokes, but right. you think them. But you think them, which yes. Varys is like, huh, <laughs> all right, you got me. Um, and they're talking about how, as we had heard, Astapor and Yunkai have gone back to slaving. Yeah. Right. And then Tyrion's like, well, look, like we're sitting on these weapons that nobody's used yet. Yeah. Right. Significant big weapons. Right. Now. And I, one of the best lines of the whole episode is, "That's what I do. I drink and I know things." Yeah, yeah. It's right? a great. If he ever gets like a, a trading card, that will be the right. quote at the bottom. Right. Exactly. Of it. That would um, be House Tyrion. Exactly. And uh, during that scene, when he's talking about his knowledge of dragons, which they've foreshadowed before, um, and it's it's using him in the right way, like some random character knowing that would be a, sort of a cop out, but him right. knowing that. He, t he talked in the second episode with Jon Snow when they're off on the way to the wall that like reading these books keeps the mind sharp. Like That's why you need to know these things. Right. I was very afraid that when he was talking to Missandei about how they, you've been around the dragons, I thought he was going to send her. And I was very worried that that would be the death of Missandei. Yeah, that was an interesting thing. I, I thought he was going to bring her down and have her introduce him. Like social proof, kind yeah. of. Like, like, hey, I'm your cool. friends. Introduce me to your friends. Yeah. And no, he doesn't. He just goes down there. Which that was a really interesting scene. I was worried it was going to be like that scene that you get at the very end of the last book that we've got so yeah. far, right? We and shouldn't say too much, but yeah, there's a scene very similar. Similar to it, scene, which ends differently. <laughs> much differently, right? <sighs> but Tyrion goes down, and like that that speech about him wanting the dragon, like that bit. That's a great scene, and. Yeah. You know, he he does appear to make some kind of, like, maybe some kind of connection. It's hard to tell. The dragons are hard to read. Yeah. Right? Like, I they like are the clearly intelligent. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it turned its head and neck right. towards him. I don't know that, it, like, he predicted that they could be more intelligent than humans, but it's not a horse. Like, right. they, they know what's going on. Right. They not only know that they're chained, they know what portion of the chain needs to be disconnected for well, them to be free. And you get the sense that they're listening to him. Right? Like yes. You get the sense that they're listening to him. He unchains the second one. And then they're like, all right, peace out. Mm. All right, thanks. We're out. Good. Bye. Yeah, yeah, He was very happy to be able to get out. Right. And, uh, and yeah, I think to that point, when he first goes down there, 
it begins the fire in its throat. Right. And that's when I, I feared right. a little bit that he would die. I do think as much as Game of Thrones can kill anyone, I still feel like Tyrion has a special protection that no other character except perhaps Daenerys has. Right. Like Maybe. I wasn't very afraid he would die, but it was not impossible. Well, and the thing that I think was interesting, I don't know if you caught this, I, I felt like what you see Dinklish do in his performance is that Tyrion bows his head. Like yes. he, he, he puts his head down and looks through his eyes like what kind of looks through his eyebrows and kind of bows his head to those dragons. Yeah. And then they're like, "All right, we'll give you a minute." And that was interesting because that's that's that puts them far ahead of horses or dogs. Like yeah. that's a point, that's a being that like understands a gesture of respect. Mm -hmm. and that's a big that's kind of a big development, yeah. right? Like that tells us, "Oh, okay. These dragons are sharper than I think that we've really considered yeah. before." Yeah, it was actually again very similar to something in uh, Harry Potter where the hippogriff or whatever you have to you have to bow right. and show it respect. Um, but the dragon's probably smarter than the hippogriff, and uh, and we also see every time they take time off the dragons, you can expect the dragons will have grown, even though they're chained and even though they're under, underneath. I mean, those things are every bit as big as Drogon was when he right. attacked uh, the Colosseum. Right. Those things are serious weapons, and we don't know when they walk to the back of that room. Is there a way for them to get out? Presumably, that, that door is not the only way in. He still has to get them out of the room, but now you have three dragons potentially looking for Daenerys. Right. Um, you have dragons that now the idea of Tyrion getting on one, that seems much more plausible now. Right. They accept him. He touched one. Right. That's going to be an exciting scene. Right. Too. If by accept you mean didn't eat him. They did not eat him. <laughs> That's all the acceptance I would need from right. a dragon. But maybe he'll be, maybe he can get them fed now. Right, like and that keep might them be growing. Yeah. Keep them growing. Um, although I did like the capper to that scene is when he says to Varys, like, next time I have an idea like that, punch me in the face. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It, even though it worked, I mean, yeah. Uh, and that was another. Uh, it's it's always interesting when I read reviews and other people's comments on f like what people think about the episodes. I love the first episode. Most people thought that it was slow, that not much happened. I guess. Um, and I didn't really grasp until I looked back on this episode how much each, other than maybe Tommen, each of the storylines advances. Like you have a new, right. you turn a page. Right. I mean, you, you walk through a door. Um, like we're going to get to Theon in a second, but the dragons are now free. Like that's, right. that's big. And these are relatively, they're not huge scenes, right? Like we're getting some compact scenes, but they move things forward like Bravos, right? Like we see Arya yes. and Bravos. Thank God. We see her getting her daredevil training, right? Like and she's better. And she's getting a little bit better, <laughs> a little. right? Right. And then Jock and Hagar shows, or somebody with that face shows up and starts asking her questions and, and takes her off. And it's like, all right, now she's going to get trained for real. Yeah. And that's maybe like two minutes of the show. Right? It's yeah, it was a, It's fast. a short bit, but it's a key bit, right? And, it, and like the end of that scene is, uh, you know, I, what did she say? I, you don't need the, you're not a, a girl is not a beggar anymore. Yeah. Right? I was really worried that they were going to have her there the whole season or half the season. I'm glad that they abandoned the train. We only yeah. need to see a little snippet of it. I don't know where it's going from here, but get her out there somehow. Like right. training on the road, on the job. Let's get right. some buddy cop stuff. Like get her... She hasn't seen another major character in way too long at this point. Right, right, and that'll be uh, yeah. That was a nice little scene. And then, we, then we we see a lot of stuff happen in Winterfell. Yes, big again yeah. stepping yeah stepping right. forward on that. Right, Roose and Ramsay and the I new warned Lord, him last review. The new Lord Karstark talking about how they haven't yeah. found Sansa yet. Yeah, you know they found the bodies of the guards. Um, tinier Lord Karstark. Right, the tinier Lord <laughs> yeah. Karstark. Uh, and Ramsey says, Ramsey says something that sounds really bloodthirsty, and Roos kind of corrects him and says, look, like you get the reputation of being a mad dog. You'd be treated like one. You're going to be treated like a mad Except dog. Except he's not, like, if you know he's a mad dog, don't let him hug you, you fool. But yeah, so he had the idea that they should do what the Wildlings did, send a force to, to kill Jon Snow. He doesn't know right. that Jon Snow was dead at that point in the episode. Um, ha. And then... He reveals that this is something that we could do, even if the North rises against us, as long as the, right. as long as the Karstarks, the Umbers, and the Manderleys, which I don't think we've seen in the show yet, even though it's a relatively right. big part of the books. Um, right. And like that's his plan. Right. For once, Ramsey actually has a plan that's not, or it seems... You a know, messed up plan. A, I mean, it's look, like it's vicious and nasty, but it's not insane. Yeah. Right? It's not like, oh, I'll just go up there and I'll kill Jon Snow. He's like, no, 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 we are... Our lords, our liege lords, our bannermen, 
have a, have more army combined than anyone else, mm -hmm. right? Like in the in the north, yeah, in the north, right? All the rest combined, right? I think, we got yeah. this, Dad. We're cool. Yeah, and I should have picked up on it that he's he's saying that plan about the Karstarks with the Karstark there. Karstark doesn't say anything. This is something that they had already talked about. Oh, that's a good point. And I hadn't I didn't notice that. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that till you just brought that up. That's a good point. So. Because, of course, once right. the thing that happens happens, you're wondering how Car the Karstark is going to respond. Right. So then the maester comes in and says, Walda's given birth to a boy, right? And, and you see a look cross over Ramsey's face. And he hugs him. And then... Gives him a little... Oh, he, well, uh, Roos says, you know, you'll always be my firstborn. Right. Which is exactly what you should say to avoid being stabbed. Unfortunately, he still gets stabbed. Right. And the, the, what well, what he doesn't say is, but if something happens to you, I got another kid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. Right. But, I mean, Ramsey, the new cuddlier Ramsey, who is sad that his uh, girlfriend died, says, you know, I, I, thank, I, I love that you said that. And then you have the stabbing, and the way they shot it, and I think it's intentional, you don't know who stabbed who. Yeah, there's a moment of that. Where they both like, look like they've been stabbed. Right. And it's the exact same way that he stabbed um, Rob Stark. Bruce Bolton did. Right. Close up, right in that spot. They're like hugging each other, right. basically. How stupid of he was he to allow Ramsey to run wild with another boy on the way? You can't, that's too stupid. Yeah. It's, you know, look like everybody's got, we've talked about this last season, right? Everybody's got a blind spot. Yeah. Or last, last episode, we talked about everybody's got a blind spot. And Bruce's blind spot was Ramsey. And even though he acted like he kind of had Ramsey's number, not to that extent, yeah. right? Not to that extent. And so then there's that great moment where Ramsey says to the maester, like, oh, he was poisoned by our enemies, right? And the maester comes in and he's like, all right. And Karstark's like, speak to your lord with yeah. respect. And it's like, oh, okay. Karstark knows where his bread is buttered. Exactly, yeah. Right? Which, which leads me to believe that they had already knew that, yeah. Bruce, that Ramsey was going to do that. That, that scene that, with Walda is brutal. That's, it's pretty brutal. And you know as soon as they're together, how is he going to do it? Right. And then as when soon he says, as you open it, hold him. You're like, don't give that kid your. No, no. Ah, I no. thought he was going to throw him in a fire or something. Yeah. I was I, really worried about that. Right. And it's messed up that we think that the show will do that. That he right? could just throw a baby in a fire. Right. Yeah. Well, I was afraid he was just going to go, like, break the kid's neck. Like, oh. it was going to be something terrible that we'd see. I mean, not that what happened isn't terrible. And yes. they draw it out. They do draw and it out. This, long, and this was a show where we saw, as much as, like, we were doing some quick cuts with scenes. There were some parts that really, like even the stuff with Tyrion with the dragons, like there were. This show was not afraid to take this particular episode, mm -hmm. drag moments out to drag out the tension, including the last scene, including the last scene, which we'll get to in a minute. But you know, the, with Tyrion talking to the dragons was a nice, slow, tense scene. Mm -hmm. This with Walda in in the in the dog pen was very tense and took its time. Um, yeah, this and this Walda show... realizes what's going to happen. I, I, I love. I mean, I'm glad that they didn't actually show it. Some people were still mad that they did it. That they they apparently that they, yeah. they sort of drew it out as long as they did. But that's Ramsey. And right. I mean, this isn't just a random kill. It's not like he plucked a peasant and let it right. in. He's this still is gonna... about protecting his position right. as the head of the household. Right. This is a political move. But he's also going to take his time and enjoy it. Yeah, he's going to enjoy right. it. He's still the same person. Right. Um, but and, and it's easy to gloss over, but Roos has been a character for a really long time. I mean, that's a major character. He's been yeah. in so many episodes. To kill him, to kill his new lord brother or whatever, right. and his mom, that's, that's a big thing. It doesn't stand out as much because we've already had the Red Wedding, but that's significant. Right, and so now Ramsey's what, the Warden of the North? I guess. Right? But, but I don't even know under whose authority. Like, Roos... Well, Bruce, technically rebelled against King's Landing. Right, but that was all part of the plot, right? Because then he helped kill Rob Stark because he switched. That was the deal he cut with yeah, I thought that there was some... Tywin. That was the deal he cut with Tywin. That's true, but I, th I thought that since then he did something against the Crown, but now no, I, I don't think he's remember. still working for the Crown, if I remember well, but correctly. He, but remember, he was going to have that plan with, uh, with Littlefinger. I don't even remember exactly what that plan oh, was playing, going to be. He was playing everybody against each other, right? So I don't even know... Does Ramsey have the authority to lead? I mean, he has the numbers. He has the effective authority. Right. And Tommen is a little bit too busy to do anything well, about it. Well, that goes back to the riddle that Varys asked. I think it was Varys who asks, like, about, you know, between the, the, the Septon and the King 
and the, the merchant, warrior or whatever. Right, oh, the who, merchant, yeah. Right, who can get the cell sword to kill the other two, right? Like, where does the power, like, that's the riddle that we get early on in the book. Mm. Power lies wherever men think it lies. Yeah. Right? And Ramsey could capitalize on that. Yeah. And I, I don't know at this point, are there enough wildlings, theoretically, to beat the combined, like, vassals of... Probably not. I don't know, yeah. Probably not. I mean, maybe, I guess they have giants. That's something. We'll see. And it's easy to say that you've got the Manderleys, but maybe we'll actually see... Uh, that right. place for the first time. Yeah, uh, and then we go outside Winterfell to see, you know, get that quick scene with Brienne. Little, yeah, little scene. Right, little scene where Brienne's telling Sansa where she last saw Arya, right? Yeah, we get so few of those connections. Yeah. That they They're, know each other are alive. Well, it was interesting because one of the things that happens in that scene is, is Brienne says, yeah, she was with a man. <laughs> like She doesn't say who. Right, she doesn't know who the Hound is. Right, because that's when she does. Saw she not know who the hound is. She she should. fought the hound. I mean, she was a knight. She should be aware of who the king's uh, son. I mean, it's not like she's looking was. people up on the internet. I guess that's true. I just assume with the burn fit. Yeah, maybe maybe she doesn't know. I guess. Well, that's the thing is is you know she fights the hound, right? And Arya takes off. Yeah. Right, but she. She clearly didn't know who that was. She was just after I guess Arya. that's true. I, I feel like she should. I feel like the knights should know of each other. But I guess it, it makes sense that she doesn't. Or she I, did know and she didn't think it was important. Well, that's, right? yeah, and that's interesting. She may, might not know the, the connection that Sansa has with the Hound. Right. That's one of the things that we have to remember as viewers is that we know more than most of the characters. Do, yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, it's the thing where Ramsey's talking about going and killing Jon Snow. Like, yeah. buddy. Get with the program. Exactly. Like, and I wonder, would would Sansa have been, would she feel better for Arya or worse if she knew that the Hound was with? And we got to remember that the Hound offered to take Sansa out of King's Landing to right. the Wall, I believe, ends up sort of doing something like that with Arya right. uh, along the way. Right. And so, then, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, uh, so we have, we know that they're going to go to the Wall, which we sort of figured they had to do at this point. God knows what's going to be waiting for them there. But they're going to go that Theon chooses not to stay with them is the big development, I think, for that group. Yeah, and now he says he's going back home to the Iron Islands. Because being killed isn't punishment enough. Right. So, I mean, what does that mean? Like, he assumes that his father is still alive because his father had lived until this episode. I mean, would his father torture him? Like, his father probably doesn't care about him. I mean, his genitals right. are I mean, cut off. Does he think he's going to... I mean, he can't think he's... I. I don't, you know, it's interesting because Theon, this Theon is talking about making amends and how he's trying to redeem himself, right? Mm. So what is, what does redemption look like to him? I thought right? it was saving Sansa. I, I thought so too. But, you know, now that Sansa's with Brienne and Pod, you know, Sansa's clearly in better hands yeah. than with a guy who's been mutilated and, and Sansa's clearly a better fighter. And maybe he can do more good back at the Iron Islands. Helping you know, his sister, maybe? Maybe. So he goes back, you know, he's, that. we end that scene with his intention of going back to the Iron Islands. We go to the Iron Islands, and we see Balon talking to the Yara. Yara, right? It was Asha. Asha, but yeah, but Yara, Yara in the now. show for some Right, reason. because there was Osha. Osha, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Who I would like to see again. Come on, show writers. Right. Uh, so we see them arguing about what to do. What to do, right? And Yara is totally right. 100% right. <laughs> Maintaining those forts, there's no, you get, they, I'm not saying that they shouldn't try to conquer land, theoretically, even, at least temporarily. Right. Not those places. That is a waste of yeah, men. Yeah, but you it know, It makes you look weak. I mean, that's, that's Balon acting out, right? Like, Balon is still smarting from when he got put down earlier. Yeah. You know, decades ago, and now he's taking his petty revenge. I mean, not petty. Balon's a relic. Right. Like he he his mind is not in what's happening now. Right. He's got no idea. He's got no clue. And which also shows us what happens when he walks out on that catwalk. Now, we don't know that from the way the book goes cuz the way the book talks is like, oh, there was just a storm. And he was thrown off. And he was thrown off. Like, yeah. But now you have to wonder, oh, is this was he what really happened thrown off? anyway? Yeah. I mean because that guy does show up the next right. day. They don't actually even name him in this episode. We just know that he's a brother of Balon. Right, but um, not Damp Hair. Who I right? think is the guy the in the guy. next scene, but they also right. don't name him. Right. Maybe they don't want to overwhelm you too much. Yeah, maybe not. Right, um, so Balon had a couple of brothers, right? Mm -hmm. And, or was 
Dan Perez's cousin, we should look this up. I don't know if it's his brother. It might anyway. be. Far more frail than I would have expected. I, like, pictured him being this hulking right, guy. Right, because they write about him being a lot bigger. Yeah, and I mean, tougher, that guy was, right? like, Gandalf the White's younger brother. Like, and also, and w there's another brother out there that we haven't seen. Will we see him eventually? Right, right. and they mentioned that there's going to be a King's Moot, which mm -hmm. is everybody getting together, and, and you know, they, they will get into this. But in the book, that's when all of of the Ironborn get together and pick who they're gonna follow as their new yeah. king cool when, there's a pro when there's a problem with the line of succession. Yeah, yeah, it's, right? it's an odd form of limited democracy in a world that right. has very little of it. Of um, all people, the Viking types, Of all people, right? yeah. And they gloss over it really quickly. I, I, I assume they'll probably keep that to an episode or two. I don't think that they'll spend too much time on that. Right. And it's odd that, I mean, that we're finally gonna have this. This was far earlier in the books. Right. Um, and I wonder, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I wonder how much we'll get to in this season of that storyline because a lot has happened since then. Right. Um, not that you could even theoretically predict based on what you've seen in the show, of course. Yeah, that'll be, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. We'll see where it goes, but the most important, so this is the stuff we've been dying to see, is the scenes back in Winterfell. Back in right. Castle Black. Oh, sorry, back in yeah. Castle Oh, Castle can I make Black. one prediction? Sorry, I keep. Sure. Uh, I wonder, so you said what would be redemption for him. I don't know that this would be redemption. I don't know that we've even seen it in the show, but the, the culturally, the, the, the people from the Iron Islands have this thing of drowning their people. Like It's like a baptism by drowning, and right. then you come back reborn. Right. Could that be his form of redemption? He comes back as a religious like, follower of the drowned god? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, he's going back there for a reason. There's got to be something there for, there for him. Okay, so All right, most so important scene. Go back to Castle Black. Yes. Right, and we see Davos come in to talk to Melisandre, mm -hmm. and she's having a crisis of faith. She's a sad sack. Like she's given up. She's given up. It's all done, and he's you know, and she says like everything I've seen in the flames, it's all gone. Jon Snow is dead, and Davos asks the question everybody's been waiting to hear, which is, does he have to be? Mm -hmm. Right, and there's there's she says that she's never done this before. She's never, she didn't, she doesn't think she has that power. She's heard about it done. And he has to really kind of twist her arm. Like yeah. she, or not twist her arm, but really like beg her to do it, right? Because yeah. she says like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like my God's abandoned me. I'm having, you know, and she doesn't believe anymore. Yeah. And I love that Davos is like, look, like fuck the gods. Fuck the seven. Fuck the drowned God. Fuck the Lord of Light. Like just try it. Yeah. Just please try it. Yeah, I like the fuck the gods. I'm not a devout man, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> like that. Right. And it's, um, so it's interesting that he has to be the one to get her to, to try it. So she's not sure that she can do it. She's not sure. And has to remind he, her, like, look, here's the crazy shit that I've seen you do. Yes. You You've have done power. amazing things. Like, why is this stopping you? Well, and also, I mean, look, she did those leeches back in the day to right. kill the false kings. Well, we had... Stannis possibly killed. There was yeah. no reference to him in this episode, so that's a false king killed. And now Balon. Right. All of them have died. Right. So that's another sign of her power. But so she doesn't she doesn't think that she can do it. She doesn't know that she should do it. She thought that John was important, but then he died, so she questions that. And she also cautions him that the one experience she had of seeing a man who had been brought back was again, she said something to the effect of, but he shouldn't have been, or something like that. Like, right. like it was bad. Right. So there's a lot of things that are weighing down on her as she decides to right. do it. And we get a little bit of this out of, you know, the book, go, the, the novels go into this much deeper, but we see a little bit of this from Beric Dondarrion that he talks about how it, you know, after keeping coming back so many times, it lessens Nine times, him. I think? Right. It, you sound like, Crazy. Right. You sound like uh, Principal Rooney. Nine times. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was thinking of uh, the Catwoman. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, you know, it'll be... Dondarrion comes back and he's lessened, right? Mm -hmm. it's, he's he's not the man he used to be. Yeah. And so we go into this scene with those warnings, and you see her. So there's Jon Snow lying out. She cleans off the blood. She wipes him down. She starts cutting his hair and dropping that into the fire. And she's praying, and nothing happens. You yeah. know, and and she gives that first prayer, and she kind of with her hands on him. And she prays, and nothing happens. And she kind of... But she looked like something happened. Right. And then she picks her hands up, and she puts her hands back down again, and says the prayer again, right? Says the invocation again. 
And but she doesn't look confused. She doesn't look angry. She looks resigned. Yeah. Right. I mean, okay, it's a I'll great. Do this. Like, a, well, but also like, I knew this wasn't going to work, but I'll try it again. But I knew it was going to work, and she yeah. keeps trying it, and it keeps not working. Yeah. Right. And she goes three or four times, and then we see, um, what's his name with the beard. Um, the wildling. Yeah. Like oh, I, it's been a right. while. Uh, I'm supposed to be the name guy. Right. He uh Thorin? no. Like they're all the bear fucker. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thorin Oakenshield. Uh not Thorin. <laughs> what Oakenshield. was I thinking? Right. Thorin, yeah. Uh um, great. We see we see them all uh Thorin Oakenshield from the Hobbit. That's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an I know who we're talking about. Another dude with a beard. Yeah. Um we see, and it, the way it's all staged in these long takes, and they're all just kind of looking, and the one guy, like the wildling, he's like, fuck it, I'm out. And he leaves, and they all stand there watching, and Melisandre leaves. Like, she just gives up, and she walks with her, I mean, it's... It, she it's, feels her age. Right, she feels her age. Her shoulders are slumped, and Davos just keeps looking, and almost like, it's not that he's in denial, but he's just, it's like he's pleading. Like, he's just like, yeah. please come back, please come back. And he finally, like, he's the last one out. Finally, he's like, and he leaves. and Nobody's there. And you wait. And nothing's there. And it's in that moment, I'm thinking, they're going to leave him dead. Like, maybe we've been like, wrong. Maybe we've been wrong all along. And I thought, God, we're going to watch this dead body, and it's going to cut to the credits. Yeah. And then you get, <gasps> yeah. Yeah. Ghost now, feels it first. Right. Right. The minute you see Ghost, like, Ghost kind of picks his ears up, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Finally. I thought there was some chance that they might have him come back, but not until next episode. That would have been annoying. Right. Um, it would also be very Game of Thrones for that gas to be all he gets. <laughs> right. He's back dead again. Um, but I like that they waited that as long as they hilarious. did. It's like, <gasps> and then bleed all over again. Oh, I'm still dead. Yeah. You didn't cure the wounds, you <laughs> fools. I'm still Sew wounded. me up. Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, we got what we expected. He had to come back. The, the Kit Harrington has already apologized for lying to everybody. Well, you know, to. let's talk about that though, because you know this has been a thing that we have seen around this show, and it happens in the press, right? We live in an age, not to go completely off tangent, but we live in an age where everybody is covering everything from a journalistic standpoint, and casting, the casting, and everything, where and and we have no choice but to put. I mean, these actors, these cast members. These production people, I mean, I remember when Michael Bay swore up and down before the first Transformers movies that, no, no, Optimus Prime does not have lips. Relax, everybody. And sure enough, Optimus Prime has lips in I his version. I don't remember right? that. And it's so hard to see anything on those right. robots. So here's the thing, everybody. For all the people that have said, oh, Jon Snow's coming back, Kit Harington has said, no, he's not coming back. We, we ourselves, we only have ourselves as a society to blame that mm -hmm. we make these actors have to lie to us. Yeah, and to I'm, glad keep any I'm glad they do. And I'm glad that they do, right? Because look, like, again, we're putting them in this position. So yeah. that should be a lesson to all of us that for everybody that says, oh, this person's done, yeah. right? Right? What's her name? Who plays uh, Star? Um, oh, uh, you're talking about right. Catelyn Stark. Right. Yeah. Right, for everybody who's convinced Lady Stoneheart is not coming back because the actress that plays Catelyn is gone. Yeah. Like, look, it's like there's a, while, but there's yeah, a lot of people who are clearly comfortable with lying to the press to keep the secrets of the show. Yeah. And, and that's what we got here. And I think that's kind of the right move, yeah. I hate to say it. Like, because look, if Kid Harrington says, oh yeah, I'll be back. Then right, it ruins like, it, yeah. Right, ruins the exactly. whole, like, then it takes the drama away from the story. Yeah, right? and, and even though we were fairly sure this is a very telegraphed thing, it wasn't impossible that it would right. be different. No, um, and that's the thing about this show, is, like, going into that scene, it's directed in such a way that, like, oh, shit, maybe this isn't going to work. Maybe, yeah. Right? That would have been amazing. Yeah. Right? Uh, I know that we've gone over, I just, there's one or one or two other points I want to make. One, we know, uh, this, it's great that he's back, but we have to see how he's different. Ga uh, George R. R. Right. Martin in the past has given interviews saying that if you're going to bring a character back, they have to be changed. Right. There has to be cost. His to hair will be done. shorter because it'll hair will be shorter. Um, so that's going to be interesting He'll to be see. He'll be allergic to dogs. Exactly. Now he hates ghosts. Uh, a few things I would have tweaked. It's it's a little bit odd that Davos brings up the idea. Davos doesn't like the magic. I would have preferred that Melisandre came up with it. Also, Davos's commitment to bringing back Jon Snow. Not entirely sure why he cares so much. I mean, look, Davos does appreciate the threat north of the wall, so right. maybe that's enough. 
Um, and time, the way that they stage the scene, I predicted that they would do the resurrection while the, they're trying to break down the door. That is a lot more exciting than yeah, they're going to break down the door, they get stopped, and then, oh, cool, now we have the time we I want. hear what you're saying, but I think that if you look at, at, at Davos being the one to go to the money letters at Bravos and say, look, there is a problem over the wall, and you need to give this guy the money, and he's the one who convinces Stannis, like, we got to go north. We yeah. gotta go north. So this is consistent. So this is consistent. Like That's Davos, true. Davos is maybe the one guy south of the wall who, who gets really it. understands the abject terror that's waiting on the yeah. other side of the wall. Yeah, other right? than the, the Night's Watch. Right. But I mean, outside of the Night's Watch, Davos is the one guy. Yeah. I mean, look, Davos should be king. Davos, yeah, is, Davos Seaworth is or the Tyrion. one guy who's like, oh God. I love we, Davos. Right. Every scene, I love that guy. And so I think it's consistent with him talking Melisandre into this, who also has, understandably, like, it's a beautiful scene that she's lost her faith. And a beautiful scene that he has to, I mean, yeah, look how the tables have turned. Yeah. Right? And I think that's a great, great update for those characters. And She's going to get her faith back in a big way next episode. <laughs> or maybe not. Like, you don't think I, so? I, I when he walks, like, I, is she going to be as... I think she's going to be... Well, she's going to be his priestess, I guess. But is she going to be as forthright as she had been previously, right? Like, she had a lot of attitude before. Yeah, maybe and not. And she's been humbled, right? Because now she's realized she's misinterpreted a lot of things. She's fallible. And she's fallible, and I think that maybe Good. makes her stronger, but not, but in a way that, that she needs to be stronger and not just being arrogant about it. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Anyway, that's it. That's, that's Yeah, big episode, lots of stuff to cover. We did go long. Uh, but we will be back next week with more Game of Thrones. Uh, God only knows what craziness is going to happen next season or next episode. Next episode.